we acknowledge you as the Son of God and we declare that we are yours and we ask that you will help us this morning. Thank you for your presence, Father. We really love you. Albi, can you for us bid us a gift? Dank je lieve vader dat als vanochtend weer hier kan wees en ja net weer kan getuig soos wat Marga gesê het Heere, ons, ons het is so nodig vader, ons kan niks onder u doen Heere Alle, um, ja ek vraag dat u ons sal vergewe vir die kere wat ons ja die dinge op ons eie probeer doen en ons val Heere, so ons vraag dat u met ons sal wees hier so dat u asjeblief ons oor en ons oor sal oopmaak Heere, dat u vir ons die genadige sal skenk om u aangezicht te sien vanochtend in die dienst Heere Heere, maak ons ontvankelijk vir u woord, want ons weet sonder u het ons niks nie, Heere. Wees met ons vandag en, en seen ons, Heere, seen ons met die aangezicht vandag en breek hier die woord vir ons oop vandag. Spreek in ons harte in, Heere, want ons wil vraag graag met u connect, Heere, want ons weet dit is waar ons kracht vandaan kom, Heere. Vul ons asjeblief met u gees en met u liefde vandag, want ons het het so nodig, Heere, sonder dit het ons niks nie. Amen. Christus, kies, kan ek aangaan met die mic, jammer hoor. Um, just want to, you guys, thank you very much for expressing your gift of worship. Uh, just, when you express in the anointing that you guys have, we experience Jesus, we experience his presence. So I really just want to honor you guys for expressing it. It's really a blessing to us as the body. And it goes for all of us. When we function and express our gift, the result is we experience our king as a body. So thank you guys. Rian, thanks for your obedience in that also, word, for sharing that with us. This morning we are, yeah, there's still such a strong desire on my heart, and I think it's on all of our hearts to, to trust God and ask him for help around the word of God, cultivating a love for his word, um, being self-feeders, if I can put it that way, studying His Word, enjoying His Word, eating up His Word, feeding ourselves, so that we could become mature or more mature and so that we can continue to grow. And, um, and so I'm going to be sharing something in line with that this morning. If there's some sort of title that I want to connect to this, uh, it is to desire the life beyond now. Desiring some sort of life beyond now. And, um, and there's one guy in the Old Testament that was a beautiful example of this, is Ezra. Now, I wish I could go into all details of this guy's history and why God rose Ezra up, um, but I'm not going to do it because we don't have enough time. But Ezra was, was, a, was a man that was known as a, as a Bible lover, as a scripture lover. And in Ezra 7 verse 10, it says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach it. And, um, and so, just a little bit of history or context around Ezra. So, he wrote both books, Nehemiah and Ezra. And, um, and when Ezra was called up to his position, he had a strong passion for Scripture. And he was the guy that kind of implemented this passion amongst God's people after coming out of Babylonia. So they were captive in Babylonia, then they returned. And when God's people returned, Ezra was the one to say, listen, guys, we have returned. It's time to restore the temple. But along with this, we need to restore the scriptures. And he was a guy that was passionate about, a guy that had a heart to study, not only to study, to live, and then also to teach. And he did that. And he did it very, very well. And then after this time where Ezra was raised up with this commission, with this call, there was what a lot of people will know as the silent 400 years. Anyone heard of that? So there was this time after Ezra that people know it as the silent 400 years. I don't think it was anything silent. I just think God chose to speak differently to his people. So the silent 400 years was... The terminology comes because of there was no prophets 
that we know of or that is recorded of that were raised up to speak on God's behalf, like Isaiah, like Ezekiel, like all the guys before. Then came Ezra, and, and there was this quiet time in terms of prophets. But it also established a different rhythm where this passion and this call of Ezra to study, live, and teach the word became, it was, he kind of modeled this and he established this in the synagogue at that time. And, uh, and just something out of interest, it's probably very important, maybe not important. Um, he was the guy that established the model of how the things happened in the synagogue. And one of the things that happened, and I wonder where it changed or why it changed, I haven't figured that out yet, but in the normal model when coming together as God's people was they would read the scriptures, they would study it, and then afterwards they would worship. And, uh, and that's how it worked in the early church. There was reading of the scriptures together, and then after they read the scriptures, they responded, and their response was worship. So I'm not sure if it's changed or where it changed that we come in and we worship first and then look through the scripture. Maybe it's of no importance, but it's interesting. Maybe it's something that we should try. I don't know. But it, it makes sense to me because we read about God. We read about Jesus. There's this excitement. We hear about him, what he did, what he's doing, what he wants to do. And as a response to that, we worship. Just, just out of interest's sake. So anyway, so Ezra established this. And a lot of people that came out of this was known as the Pharisees. And the Sadducees, how do you say it? Sadducees. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Who knows what the difference is between these two? Come on, someone brave. So Pharisees believed in life after death. They believed in angels and demons. They believed in the, the unseen realm, if I can put it that way, where the Sadducees, Sadducees didn't really, they, they knew that the scriptures was valuable. They knew they needed to live accordingly, and they made it very, made it a lot of effort to live accordingly, but they didn't believe in the things afterwards. Now, just something for what it's worth, maybe it's not necessary, just for that you can remember. Pharisees, Far I see, looking beyond now. Sadducees, sad you see. It's my, <laughs> it's my sad case not to believe in the unseen realm because it's really a reality. Um, just something that's probably not worth taking home, but just for, just for, for what it's worth. So then, you, so this 400 years was the years where, where this kind of teaching, this way, the rabbis, the Pharisees and Sadducees was established. And not many prophets until John. John the Baptist was the next prophet that came onto the scene. And he announced, obviously, the great prophet, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And that's where I'm going to jump into Scripture right now. So we're going to look at a scene 400 odd years later after this way that Ezra established. And there was many Pharisees and Sadducees that were well equipped knew this scriptures. And we're going to look at a scene of a very well-known Pharisee that we've probably heard of many times. And as I went through this, it was really encouraging for me. So many know Nicodemus. So we're going to read from John 3, uh, from verse 1. So if you have your Bible, please have it there. I don't have it on, on the screen. Um, but this is where Jesus, after this 400 years of what they call silence, Jesus rocks up onto the scene. And let's see what happens. And so my heart is in this, in this scripture as we read it, that we'll be able to identify points that we can relate to. So there will be many points that we possibly relate to within this scripture. But there might be points that we don't relate to, but it stirs up a desire. And let's see what our Nicodemus says. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God was not with you, with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see 
the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wants, you hear its sound, but you, want, you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. And then Jesus replied, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people do not accept our testimony. And so here is a great religious teacher. Um, and just before that, Jesus was walking in the streets of Jerusalem over Passover and he was doing miraculous signs. And people acknowledged and said, this man is from God. Look at the things that he's doing. There's no way that someone can do this and he's not from God. And Nicodemus, a well-known, well-equipped, um, well-loved by his community, looked up to teacher that everyone went to. Not everyone maybe, but a lot of people went to. He was that kind of guy. He worked hard for where he was. And, and he saw something of this Jesus on the streets of Jerusalem. And it stirred up a desire. But he knew the scriptures. He knew all that he needed to know. And he made a plan. And now there's a lot of things and a lot of stuff why people say he went in the evening. And it's probably all true. But maybe, just maybe, this Nicodemus that was well equipped in the scriptures, well loved, had a desire just to be with this man alone. And he went in the night. And he met with Jesus. And he had this conversation with him. And he didn't really understand. It was like, uh, born again? But his desire was, I want to see the kingdom of God. This is my desire. I've seen everything in the scriptures. I've seen it all. But there was still this Longing somewhere in him. It shows that, that there was this unsatisfied area within Nicodemus that was longing for something more. But how is it possible? He was well equipped. He earned a lot. People loved him. He knew the scriptures. But still, there was something that he was longing for. And he saw something of that desire on the streets of Jerusalem and the Passover feast. He saw something. He saw this Jesus doing what he was doing. And he was like, oh, I know all the scriptures. Maybe, just maybe, all these scriptures that I've been studying has been pointing to this one, Jesus. And he had to go find out for himself. And so he did. And he went um, to Jesus in the night. Then he had this conversation that we read now. And, um, and there's maybe so many points to relate. But I want to bring out a few of them. And, uh, and, and so the one point to relate is this desire that he had led him to respond. Now that's easy and, 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 and quite basic to say. But how often are we in a position right now where we've got this desire for something more? Longing for something. Yeah, we know it. And sometimes we identify it, whether it's in the body, whether it's on the streets, Whatever it is, whether it's in our quiet time, whether we read the word and there's this, there must be something more. Well, Nicodemus, he responded. He made an effort. And he went in the dark and he went to go meet with Jesus in this quiet time. For whatever reason, yes, maybe because people couldn't see him associating with this new, this new rabbi, maybe. Maybe all those things, but maybe also because he wanted to be alone with Jesus. And um, he, he did, and, and he came and he said, listen, I have faith, because he did. I've seen what you've done. I have faith. I believe that you must be from God, and he declares that to Jesus. And Jesus cuts straight through to the point, looks straight through him and says, I know what you really want. You don't want the surface level stuff, and in order to get there, you need to be born again. 
and it bowled him over. This well-equipped, well, well-known, loved by everyone guy. It, he was bowled over and he couldn't understand it. And he couldn't really grasp this idea of being born again or this is the way to see the kingdom of God. And God gives him again. Oh, Jesus responds again, sorry, to a, to a straightforward, and it kind of looks harsh the way that he's speaking to Nicodemus here. It kind of looks like he's kind of just attacking this guy. But he knows that Nicodemus is desiring something beyond Nicodemus' now. So Nicodemus knew all the things of now, but now he was desiring something beyond that. And Jesus saw that, and he knew that, and he pierced straight through and cut to the point. And he said, you need to be born again. But he didn't understand it. And often, to be honest with you, these kingdom things and what God wants to do and how he does it and when he does it and why he doesn't do it and all these questions that I do sometimes have, I don't always understand. I want to. I want to understand. I want to fully dissect it and this is how it works and this is how it doesn't work and so that I can just take it and form a pattern and tell everyone what to do and what not to do. But Jesus replies and says, listen, you will not fully grasp it just like you can't fully grasp how the wind blows. You think you can have it in your hands. You think you can kind of control this, but you can't. And this was a hard answer for a very well-equipped, full-of-knowledge guy that made his way to where he is right now. He couldn't really put his fingers on that. And still not satisfied, he couldn't figure out how to, how to have this. And, and, and guess what I'm coming through to this point at the moment is that I think Nicodemus, in all his knowledge of Scripture, he studied it well, there was this point of desire. And, um, and later, so Jesus carries on with this conversation, and he tells Nicodemus all these things about being born again. He doesn't fully understand it, and that's okay. He doesn't really get an answer either. And then he tells Nicodemus everything that's going to happen. He tells about how he's going to hang on the cross. He tells about why he's going to hang on the cross, because he so loved the world. He tells Nicodemus all these beautiful things. And then you don't really see a response in the rest of the passage. There's no Nicodemia speaks again and decides to be reborn. You don't see it there. But something had to happen to Nicodemia, and we see it later in the scriptures. And it's really, really pretty. And so in John chapter 19, later, you, you see Nicodemus is kind of, you see where he's at. And you can turn there, J chapter 19, verse 39. So we don't see what happens to Nicodemus and, and, and how he responded to this Jesus that he desired to be with alone so that he could find out something of this life beyond his now. And it says, Nicodemus, and this was just after Jesus had been taken up on the cross, everything that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus about there in that conversation, it all happened. It all happened in front of him and he saw it. And then it says, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh, aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. We see this in John 39. So, and, and I looked a little bit into this. And um, just to give you a little bit of context, 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe in today's market, and hopefully Google is right, and I'm sure there's, I looked it in a few places. Who wants to guess how much that's worth? So about three, three million rand worth of this that he brought to this Jesus in the tomb when he was, just after he was resurrected. This Nicodemus, this well-known, well-loved, well-equipped character that earned his way to where he was, knew the scriptures, everyone looked up to him. Something happened in that passage there, in this battle between him and Jesus, and not understanding, but knowing there is a desire. There's something more. There must be something more than now. 
And he saw that something more than now in that man in the Jerusalem streets. And he responded. And he went to go find him. He made every effort to get alone with this Jesus character. And when he did, he got a challenge. There was stern discipline. Jesus told him, listen, you are the teacher of Israel. You don't know these things. He must have been offended somewhere, somehow. I don't know. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But it wasn't soft, oochy, fluffy answers that he got there. It was straight to the point. Because he knew that Nicodemus desired something more than now. Something bigger than his picture that he had right now. And then, this is what his response was. So I can't say that he was reborn or he was saved or not. Because it doesn't say in the scriptures. But this action of taking about three millions rands worth of his possessions. And he said, he is well worth it. Jesus is well worth it. All my studies of the scripture as a Pharisee. Everything that I've studied up until this point is all directing and pointing to this one that I've met. And it's valuable. And so there's a lot of tradition and cultures of why they wrapped people up and then smeared them with this myrrh and aloe. Um, it, the more that it was, the more kingly or more uh, royal that the person was. And this that Nicodemus lay down and wrapped Jesus up was way above a normal king's quota. But the other reason was also is to preserve the body in this oil, this myrrh, and this aloes. And then also to give it a beautiful fragrance. And so Nicodemus, as someone like Ezra possibly, who studied the word, maybe lived the word, but definitely taught the word. And in today's age, I must be honest, we get a lot of the two. We get a lot of studying of the word and teaching of the word. But may we live this word. Because I must be honest, there's not something more discouraging as a believer and as a friend and as a husband or a brother or whatever the case may be to see friends talking about Scripture, studying it possibly, and teaching it. We hear there's testimonies, but then you hear testimony of they've fallen. They've gone into this pattern. They've slept with that person. They've done this and this and that. But they, but they studied the word and they taught it. But at times we miss the mark with living it. And there's nothing more discouraging than hearing that in the midst of my everyday when I hear that someone has fallen into the patterns of this world. It's, it's really discouraging. Sorry, just a bit off the track there. And so what I want to encourage us is that in the midst of our studying the scripture, in the midst of living it and possibly teaching it, that Jesus would be central, like it was for Nicodemus in that moment. And normally when he becomes central, normally when we meet him in that quiet time, the dark times, where he has that conversation with us, where he cuts straight to the point, where we are realizing that there's only one way to see the kingdom of God, and it's because of this being born again, having the Spirit of God. And when you get that spirit of God and you realize there is something beyond now, often the response is, I'm willing to give it all. Three million rands worth. I don't mind because I want his life to be preserved. I want his life to be a fragrance. There's something symbolic on this myrrh and aloe that he brought to the tomb to preserve the life of Jesus and that it would be a fragrance. And I'm sometimes challenging myself as is, what am I willing to give? What am I willing to lay down? What am I willing to take to Jesus and say, I'm coming with all, whether it's my life, whatever it is, because I see that there is something in you, Jesus, that is worth my all. Even more. Even more. And Nicodemus, this guy that could do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, that was well loved by everyone, this was his response. 
And there's so much that we can get in that passage. But this morning, I just wanted to encourage us as we go on this journey of asking God to help us with studying this, with living this like Ezra, and, and, with, and with teaching it, that Jesus Christ would be the central point. Because for 400 years after Ezra, people got it right to study it. And possibly to live out all the laws. And very right to teach it. But they became what we know as Pharisees. And then came the one that fulfilled all of that. The one who truly studied it. The one who truly lived it. And the one who truly taught it. I want to just quickly tell just a quick story of David Pawson. I heard it from him, so it's not my story. But he was a teacher of scripture for a long time. And he was coming up to a series that he was teaching on the Holy Spirit. But at that time, he was not a born-again believer and received the Spirit. He was just well-equipped in teaching, and he was well-equipped in the Scriptures. And he said it came to the point where he was doing studies of the Holy Spirit, and long story short, he realized he's in big trouble here, because not even him has the Spirit of God. And, and, and just to cut a very long story short, he, he was baptized in the Spirit, he was born again and received the Spirit, and he went to go teach on the series of the Holy Spirit. And someone in the audience came to him afterwards and says, what happened to you? He said, what do you mean? He said, no, you've been teaching here for a very long time. Something's happened. And, and David Pawson explained, this is what happened. And he said, no, I can see that. And he was something that was, he was someone that was now teaching something that he knew and he lived. And here Jesus rocks up onto the scene. And all of a sudden it was someone who was being able to teach these scriptures that all the Pharisees had taught. But it was something different. And all the common people could relate and say, we want something of him. And Nicodemus was one of them. And he responded. And so my heart is this morning that there would just be something in Nicodemus' response. How are we relating? Many of the people desire Jesus. And it says in the scriptures in John chapter 2 that they desire Jesus because of what he could do for them. So we had faith. They had faith because of what he did. And they ran after him to try and get something. And that's okay. But their heart was, what can we get from his hand? And Nicodemus had a different heart attitude. I want to get with him. I, I just want to get with him. I want to be alone with him. Whether he does something for me or not, that's fine. I don't need a miracle right now. I just want to be with Jesus. And was there miracles that came as a result? I'm sure there was. But Nicodemus' heart was something more. It was something beyond what he could get now. And it was to see the kingdom of God. And when he did... His response was, here's my everything, three millions rands worth to preserve your life and so that you would be a fragrance to those that come. And may we be that way. So I've just got a desire to maybe do something along the lines like Ezra is to respond in worship. So if Joe and the team, is that okay? That we can have one last song with this in mind that um, may we... May we seek Jesus in the midst of studying the scriptures. May we seek him in the midst of living it. And may we seek him in the midst of teaching it. Where he would be central point. That he's got us this, um, this incredible life that we desire. Like Nicodemus had that desire to respond. And so let's stand in worship with this last song. It was such a beautiful song to me. I asked Joe if we can just respond just by worshiping again. And, um, and by all means, I also want to encourage, just maybe after the sermon or after the service, after the worship, if you're in that place that you've maybe nev never met this Jesus, like Nicodemus did, or maybe you have, and, and there's this, this longing or desire like Nicodemus had, although he was in a very comfortable equipped, well-known, well-sorted place, but still had this desire for something more, longing for something beyond his now. 
then, then come pray with us afterwards. And, and, and I think most of us here possibly have, have met this Jesus, but this world and its patterns is really sick and just desires us to be removed from this incredible Jesus that Nicodemus ran to. But when he ran to him, something happened in this guy's heart where he was willing to give his everything. And so if you are in that place, please come and pray with us. We really want to pray with you. If you've never met him and you've only heard of the scriptures, you've only heard of it, like most of us have in South Africa, but never come to the point where, yeah, you know what I desire, I'm, I'm going to go to him. Then come pray with us. Um, because it's not worth going through another 400 years of studying scripture and knowing it all and trying to live it out where you can't because the Pharisee Nicodemus realized that but somehow trying to teach it it's not possible without being born again without his spirit it's very clear so let's worship and if you've got a desire to respond then let's pray together in front